Welcome, uh, everyone. Good day, uh, and thank you for joining this uh, TIPS Development Dialogue webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Guillaume Massonclair, I'm a senior economist uh, at TIPS, and I will be uh, your facilitator for the next couple of hours. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you to, uh, to this webinar on behalf of TIPS. Um, for those who are not entirely familiar with TIPS, uh, we are an economic policy research institute based in Pretoria, and uh, we work at the interplay of economic development, social progress, and environmental sustainability. Uh, and therefore, uh, the topic of today's discussion is really at the crux of uh, what we work on. We are going to talk today about uh, um, the sectoral interventions, opportunities that uh, can be associated with fostering a just transition in Mpumalanga specifically. What uh, about the just transition? Uh, if you are here today, you probably know a little bit about it. Uh, but in essence, a transition is underway uh, to a uh, low carbon or green economy. Uh, and that's particularly uh, happening in the energy sector with the progressive phase out of the coal value chain. And that is an agenda that is rising around the just transition to say that this transition that is unfolding um, should be as just as possible so that vulnerable stakeholders, um, such as low-income communities, small businesses, workers, do not bear the brunt of the impact and could actually be better off through uh, this transition that is unfolding. In uh, today's discussion, we are focusing on Mpumalanga uh, because in the short term, when it comes to the impact of climate change, both from physical and transition uh, factors, it is going to be primarily felt on the coal value chain in the country, a value chain which is essentially located uh, in Mpumalanga and particularly in two districts, in Kangala and Gyasi Bende. Um, of course, the just transition uh, agenda is relevant for virtually every value chain and every region in the country. But we need to have dedicated, dedicated plans and strategies to address the issues of just transition uh, as they are unfolding in particular value chains or in particular geographies. So I'm very pleased uh, to have an excellent uh, panel of contributors today uh, to discuss this topic very much in a forward-looking and solution oriented fashion. We'll look at first the overview of the plans for Mpumalanga uh, around the green economy development. And then we'll look at various possible opportunities uh, which could be implemented uh, in the region from agriculture and mine rehabilitation to renewable energy uh, to the use of coal ash. Um, of course, this is just a subset of potential opportunities, but it's a starting point. The recording uh, of this event will be available, uh, as will the presentations. Uh, and if you have missed any of the previous events uh, of TIPS on the topic or on other topics, this is all available on the TIPS website. I would encourage everyone to use the uh, Q&A as well as the chat function to uh, ask questions. If you use the chat function, uh, it automatically sends the messages only to panelists. So I would encourage you to click first on the all panelists and click to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your contribution and not just the panelists in uh, the software.
we uh, wanted to start the session with an introduction uh, by uh, the Mpumalanga government of their strategy. Um, but I see that Nati has had some uh, uh, issues to uh, connect uh, effectively. Um, and is as an attendee. Um, so actually, can I ask Mohamed to uh, allow Nati to, uh, to present? Uh, please. Um, and following the introduction by, by Nati uh, of uh, Empomalanga's strategy, we uh, will go then into particular uh, sectoral uh, opportunities. Nati uh, will introduce the Green Economy Plan from Pumalanga. He is the Senior Manager for Economic Policy and Planning in the Department of Economic Development and Tourism at the Pumalanga Province. He currently serves as the Project Manager as well for the establishment of the Green Economy Cluster in Pumalanga, uh, which will coordinate all Green Economy related activities. So really at the crux of Green Economy development, uh, in the province. Nati, uh, you've got 15 minutes to set the scene. Uh, a very welcome to you. The floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you, Gayla, and uh, thanks to everyone present. Uh, um, let me not waste time maybe on the policy background. Obviously, we uh, as a province guided by the national policies and we always make sure that we adapt our policies to the national uh, policies uh, that are drafted by the national government. Uh, however, let me also hasten to mention that we are aligned to the national development plan and we were very much proactive when this work was being done and as provinces we were invited to also contribute um, to that work. But as a province, we also have our own um, policies. Uh, one of those policies being what we call Vision 2030 in the province. Uh, Vision 2030 is aligned to the National Development Plan. And we also have another policy in the province, which we call the Mpumalanga Economic Growth and Development Path. Um, this policy, which is called the National, which is called the Mpumalanga Growth and Development Path, is just the economic chapter. It's an economic chapter of the Vision 2030 of the province. Now, in terms of uh, this very policy, which is called the Mpumalanga Growth and Development Path, we made it a point that we align to the National um, uh, Development Plan and we are aligning in different aspects, but one that refers, that relates to the work that we are talking about at this moment is the one that talks to your uh, transition to your low carbon uh, economy, as well as the one that talks about um, uh, job creation, because in the process of doing this, we are also concerned about issues of creating employment and crowding investments into our province. And therefore, this plan comes with the uh, uh, principles. There are principles that are underpinning the work that we do. We say everything that we do as a province uh, must be community driven. It must uh, have an element of beneficiation. Uh, we must focus on our youth. Um, the province is 75% youth. Uh, so we're a very young province. We are a youthful province. So all the things that we do must make sure that uh, they promote opportunities for youth. Um, we are also saying in everything that we do, in our transition to our long carbon economy, we must make sure that uh, we also bring on board our small enterprises and we must uh, bring small enterprises, including cooperatives. So that is what is critical in the work that we do. 
So as part of that uh, provincial plan, uh, or rather, which is a blueprint of the province, um, we then took a, a, a sector or rather a sectorial approach. We are focusing on different aspects, but we are saying there are the sectors that we prioritize, which we believe that uh, if we um, do work, uh, um, or rather if we, um, um, you know, sort of um, uh, do everything that we do, uh, they must respond. These sectors will assist us in terms of uh, the key issues that we want to undertake. One of those is your human capital development. We believe it's very, very important that uh, um, uh, we sort of uh, capacitate, we give skills um, uh, both to the youth and also to small enterprises. And this can be done in collaboration with your big industry in the province. So the human capital element, which is focusing on capacity building in terms of uh, the population of the province is critical. We then developed a plan that talks to that. We also focusing on rural development because we are a, 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 a rural province. And in terms of this, we have developed uh, what we call a, a comprehensive rural development program for the province. There is a strategy that looks into this. Uh, but we're also saying infrastructure development is key. And as a result, we developed what we call an infrastructure master plan and a water master plan for the province. These are all policy documents that are in existence and which were a requirement of uh, the blueprint, which we call the Mpumalana Economic Growth and Development Path. And then we said, it is also important that we pay attention to issues of your production. And therefore here, we developed what we call the industrial plan for the province and also a trade and investment master plan for the province. So all these policy frameworks are assisting us uh, in, uh, in growing the economy of the province, uh, most importantly. And we prioritize certain sectors uh, that are going to assist us to achieve these things. And one of those sectors is basically your agriculture and forestry, and which is why today when we show later on, we will demonstrate that agriculture and forestry are key in the province. And we are saying these are some of the areas of work that we must focus on. We are also, we are a mining province and we are saying, let's look into how we can uh, mine, mine sustainably, um, because as much as we talk just transition, we understand that uh, the mines are still going to remain an integral part of our energy mix in the country. And therefore we are saying for now, we should look at ways of uh, mining sustainably. Uh, we also spoke about manufacturing, tourism, uh, energy is one of the areas as well as the green economy and, and, and ICT. These are some of the sectors that we said we identified as key in the province. However, the two sectors, which is your energy and your green economy, are new sectors that we feel that we need to do a lot of work, which is why we have started work around establishing an institution that will assist us in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the green economy work uh, that we are undertaking. And that uh, cluster I'm going to talk about later on. Uh, but what is key here to note is that we are interested in creating employment. We are saying in creating employment, in pursuing our economic activities, we must also take care of the environment, which is where the whole question of just transition features. Um, these are some of the job drivers. I'm not going to spend time into this. However, as part of also that uh, blueprint, that provincial blueprint, it also required of us to develop support plans. And one of the key support plans uh, that we developed is what we call the Green Economy Plan for the province. The Green Economy Plan um, is focusing on different aspects. Um, and we believe that uh, if we implement this plan, it is going to take us to where we want to go to as a province. Um, the one area of focus of that plan is basically um, the biomass. Uh, though we have since changed the plan a bit, we have tweaked it uh, just to focus on energy. Um, but here you will see, as I show this, that uh, 
it's, 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 it's not organized in form of those sectors, but we have topics or rather pillars that we felt at the time were going to assist us to do this work uh, efficiently. Um, we are a forestry province. We, we, we have done a number of studies and uh, biomass is one of uh, the biggest contribution that we can make into the energy space in the country. And as such, we are talking to industry. I'm sure some of us would know that uh, companies like uh, Yosapi here in Botswana, um, through uh, integrating or rather through cooperation with the provincial government have developed a huge biomass plant. And there are other players who are also approaching us uh, in relation to this kind of work. But we're also looking at issues of your farming and food security. That is another key pillar of the plan. Um, here we are talking sustainable uh, small scale and community farming uh, projects. This is very, very key if you talk uh, issues of uh, um, uh, transition to your low, low carbon. Uh, things of uh, training in sustainable agricultural practices. These are things that we're paying attention to. Uh, agroforestry, uh, we see a huge uh, opportunity, particularly, um, you know, with this aspect, uh, we believe that there are high value crops uh, that we can farm on in the, in, the, in the forestry that is in the province. Uh, so we are really looking into all this kind of uh, work. Uh, but we also felt that uh, there is another pillar that was important to us, which talks to your towns and urban centers. Here we are basically talking issues of your waste management, very, very critical. And we are saying maybe let's look into energy using our landfill sites, uh, generating electricity from this and um, roll out of your solar PVs and, uh, and, uh, and your wind very lately. That is another uh, um, uh, form of uh, what you call that we are talking about, form of energy that we are talking about and also some small initiatives like your clean cooking stoves, all these kind of things. Uh, but also, it also focuses on your sustainable tourism. Um, those are the key pillars of the plan that we develop. However, I must also mention that when we're developing the green economy plan, um, we were also in a process of uh, putting together a chapter that talks to your climate change and mitigation strategy. Uh, which essentially look at your whole issue of your energy mix. We are looking at uh, the issues of improving your energy efficiency, uh, reduction of emissions. Um, these are some of the issues that we are basically looking at and building capacity for sustainable low carbon economy. So there's been a lot of work um, that has been done by the province or rather collaborating with the private sector. But what we're trying to address is all these aspects that are coming from our policy documents as a province. So we have tried to put across, or rather we are working with uh, different stakeholders. We are putting together a cluster entity in the province. And uh, this is what we call the Mpumalanga cluster or rather green economy cluster which is going to assist us uh, uh, as a form of, uh, you know, your networking platform. And we believe that uh, through this, we will have a one-stop shop. Um, there are quite a number of activities that are happening across the province. And we feel that there is a need for us to then work with different stakeholders across the board, uh, coordinate the work that is happening in our space. We are talking to our municipalities. And we have seen, seen, seen the need that we must coordinate these activities and uh, the municipalities that are in the area are requesting of us uh, to coordinate this aspect so that every player, every work that is taking place in the province, we should be, we should be aware of that work. And uh, if there is a need to direct certain players to work together, we can do that because we know who's working in our space. So this cluster entity is going to address that. But what is even more important is that we realize that there is trust deficit between the private sector and the public, uh, uh, the public sector and the private sector. And we felt that it is necessary to have such a platform um, so that we try and, uh, you know, sort of co-create solutions, work together. And uh, in that way, we will find better solutions to deal with the issues that are a challenge. Um, 
So basically, this is what the, 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 the cluster is going to be responsible for. Um, in terms of the sectors that we are prioritizing, um, uh, which this cluster entity will focus on, one is energy, two is water. We will also be looking at issues uh, of the circular economy. And then we are going to focus on agriculture. These are very, very key issues. We are not saying this is cut in stone. We will look into other matters, uh, but we felt that uh, in the interim, these are issues that we should uh, pay our attention to um, as a province. And we will be working with stakeholders across the board uh, with a specific focus on this, uh, on this, uh, on these sectors. Um, so this is going to be in the form. This is just the coordination work that we will do. Um, through that cluster entity, as I've already said, that uh, it will deal with the whole issues of co-creating solutions, it will deal with the issues of your trust deficit. So what is going to happen here is that you will have your academia, will apply the triple helix model, where you have your academia, you have your industry and uh, government working together. We have already started a process of putting together a committee or rather, let me rather call it an advisory committee that will advise the province on these issues. And we are drawing the members uh, from academia, private sector, and a few members from government that are forming this committee. So these members will assist us in terms of putting together uh, the structure that will coordinate all of us in the province. Let me also hasten to say that uh, this cluster is not going to compete with anyone. And this cluster is not saying anyone should stop their job and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, maybe uh, ask for guidance from the province. All we are saying is that continue to do what you do, but let's work together, let's collaborate on what you do. And if there is uh, an opportunity for us to also input or rather even assist in terms of um, uh, resources, uh, both uh, you know, your human resource and maybe if there is anywhere as government where we can uh, throw in some, some, some financial resources, we are basically saying there is space for all of us to work together. So that is what we're in essence trying to do with a, a cluster of this nature. So let me thank you very much uh, for your indulgence. That is in essence what we're trying to do as a province, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Nancy, for this, this very uh, comprehensive overview of what the province has in mind when it comes to, to its economic development and particularly uh, in terms of the green economy transition and the establishment of the, of the cluster. Um, let me throw a, a couple of questions your way. Uh, already know uh, there's, there's quite a few uh, popping in. Um, which uh, which which is really great, uh, you know, uh, in the in the Q and A, but also in chat uh, function. Uh, so let me just throw a couple a couple of questions your way uh, at this point, uh, Nati. Um, the, the first one um, is what what is the province position on uh, the restoration and rehabilitation of mining areas? as a job creator. Um, so really around restoration and rehabilitation of, of mines. Um, let me give you a couple of questions. Um, and one that's, I guess, slightly broad, but I think interesting is that, you know, what it, as part of the cluster, what is the definition of green economy? What, what, what does the province understand um, by, um, Sort of by, by green economy, I think that would be really important to understand. I mean, you highlighted some of the some of the key opportunities that 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 have been there, um, but really interesting to see what you know what is the province understanding of that transition really um, uh, in, in in terms of moving forward, um, and then a few few questions specifically on 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 biomass. Um, and uh, you know what sort of what are the opportunities to expand the biomass potential um, 
particularly just beyond just electricity generation. Uh, and I, I did see you know, the biomaterial on your slide as well as an opportunity. Um, it would be interesting to, to kind of understand the opportunities around, around that. Um, so let's start with that, really. Um, the understanding of green economy and the transition itself, um, uh, and maybe kind of tie that to the time frame that you're looking at when it comes to the phase out of coal. What are you working at? What kind of time frame are you, are you looking at? You know, uh, that'd be the that'd be first one. Um, the second one around restoration and rehabilitation of mining areas. How do you see do you see that as a key job job creator? Um, and the third area for now um, around the potential for uh, kind of the biomass the biomass uh, value chain to be developed beyond beyond electricity generation. Um, there's many more, uh, and hopefully we'll get to that. But uh, maybe let's start. Let's start with that, uh, if you may. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, our um, let Let me just mention that uh, we we are guided by the national department, or rather, the national government, in the work that we do as a province. Remember, government is government. And uh, when we talk to our stakeholders uh, in the areas where we are, they don't know that there is national government and they don't know that there is a provincial government. Um, so we have forums where we interface with the national uh, government uh, in issues uh, of this nature. And let me just mention that in terms of uh, the green economy, um, this, uh, the reason why I'm giving the background about the national department or rather the national government leading uh, in the work that we do. Um, this work came about as a requirement, uh, I think during the 2008, 2009 uh, world economic meltdown, government directed, the national government directed that one of the sectors of course that could create employment um, is the green economy. And our understanding of the green economy uh, essentially in the province is that um, in trying to mitigate climate change, uh, there would be activities that, uh, that can uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, accrue as a result of sustainable use of resources and that would create employment. So those activities which are friendly to the environment, um, uh, which are going to be able to create employment or rather we can create products from what is considered to be waste in other companies or in other manufacturers. Um, all those kind of activities would be under what we call for us uh, green economy. So anything that we do, all the activities that we pursue, which are friendly to the environment, uh, you know, your climate economy, it's essentially what we would consider our green economy in the province. Um, so that's a position which the national the national government also share uh, in this regard. And in terms of um, the other question, which is talking to which is talking to um, rehabilitation, um, the rehabilitation of mines. There is work that we started a number of years ago. We are working with a number of mining houses in the province with regards to this and other players. Uh, of course, um, I wouldn't want to mention name, but there are other names or rather there are other players that are private uh, sector uh, players that have been working with us, including the mines uh, in Bumalanga to look at this aspect including uh, the issue of cleaning or rather of uh, your mine water. And with regards to this, uh, there is success that we are beginning to record because there are pilot projects that are, that are actually taking place in the province which are focusing on rehabilitating land, using the mine water to irrigate that land. And we are beginning to see um, a successful case of, of this um, 
uh, there are some of the partners that we work with as government who have done this. Uh, of course, uh, with our involvement, and uh, we are beginning to see results. And we believe this uh, can uh, be one of the areas of work where we could, uh, if we talk, when we talk just transition, this is going to be very, very critical. It's one project that we are fiercely looking at. I mean, you can imagine the number of mines uh, that we have in the province and the mines that are closing down. Um, so this is going to be a very, very critical aspect for us uh, in terms of looking into this, particularly for agricultural purposes. Um, so it is an aspect that we're already working on and we believe that it holds, it holds a, 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 a big potential for employment creation in the province. Um, in as far as our understanding of just transition, of course, we are saying we should decarbonize we should move from um, you know, a high carbon to a low carbon economy, uh, which unfortunately at the moment, Pumalanga is one of the highest polluters. Uh, we are aware of that aspect and we are concerned about that. We are also concerned about the, the, the impact of our economic activities on the climate. Um, so that is very, very critical for us and it's quite urgent. In terms of deadlines of timelines that are set in terms of this work. Uh, I wouldn't, I know there are many countries that have committed themselves. Um, the other day I was reading some piece from Germany. I know they have committed themselves to a date. I think it's 2030 or something like that. Um, other countries, of course, have announced dates, but I know South Africa as a country, um, we, we don't necessarily we, we, haven't, we haven't moved to the level of, you know, setting time frames. even though um, there are discussion that at a certain period, maybe, you know, in 20, 30 years time, we should have achieved that. But as a province, what we thought might work for us is to set ambitious targets in terms of saying, let's start now. Um, we know the challenges that are with us, that are upon us. And we know that we're not going to have all these natural resources forever. Um, so we need to start to diversify. And when we start to diversify, we must start that process now, which is why we have started with all the initiatives that we have already, that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk to. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, you know, time is not with us, but I would have, you know, spoken about all the initiatives because there are quite a number of initiatives, including the work that ESCOM is doing in the province, uh, um, the work that is looking into the repurposing of uh, the existing assets. Um, that's work that's going to happen. And as a province, we, 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 we have prepared ourselves to work with ESCOM in this, and we are already engaging on all these plans. Um, so we, we, we have positioned ourselves, um, you know, to sort of work on these aspects because we believe that uh, this must happen and it must happen now. So we must start as a province to be seen doing what we can do. Um, in relation to the question that you asked about uh, the biomass uh, value chain, we are talking to a number of players in the province and uh, we are not only talking about the, the, you know, we are not only talking about just uh, the energy uh, when we talk biomass, there are quite a number of other things that we are looking at. And industry has even uh, approached us. We are talking about maybe collaborating in even doing research. Um, uh, in some instances. Uh, so there are quite a number of things that we are looking at, which uh, um, are detailed in the plan, in the green economy plan of the province, which we have agreed upon uh, to work with industry. We have to develop uh, some of those industry in terms of supporting with uh, the required or the necessary research. And we are working with a number of stakeholders with regards to this. So we believe that uh, in no time, we will start uh, to aggressively make sure that some of these things are taking off the ground. 
Thank you very much. I hope I've responded to some of the questions. Rather, to thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Nati, uh, for, for those, those answers. There are a flood of questions for you uh, in the Q&A. Um, and, you know, we'll get back to those a little later as well. Um, but I encourage you really, not to, to look at the Q&A and, you know, answer uh, some of those questions in, uh, in the Q&A box uh, by typing answers, at least for some of those. Uh, I'll certainly pick on those uh, questions a little later um, in, in the discussion. But for now, uh, we need to, to move uh, forward a little bit with our program. Uh, and our next input, uh, we are going to look at the role of mind rehabilitation, uh, which was raised as a, as a question just now, specifically for uh, in Pumalanga. I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome two speakers uh, and not one. Um, Louise uh, from the WF, who is the program manager of Urban Futures Policy and uh, Futures Unit at WF South Africa, uh, will, will lead the presentation uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, Carla Hudson, who is the program manager for the Mine Water Coordinating Body and the operational lead uh, for Pomalanga for the Impact Catalyst. Uh, and working hard on uh, regional sustainable mine and power station closure uh, in the region. So we're getting uh, we're getting two for one uh, on this uh, on this next presentation, uh, which uh, we are very fortunate about. Louise and, and Carla, um, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to pre uh, present. Uh, uh, as Galo said, this uh, presentation will focus broadly on the opportunities of mine rehabilitation to drive social and economic opportunities. Essentially, I will present uh, more broadly on the context and the opportunities in the existing approaches, something that Nati has already touched upon, while Carla will focus on the constraints and the hurdles that are inhibiting the rollout and scaling of initiatives that can drive post-mining socioeconomic development. Now, from WWF's perspective, we've in the past focused strongly on the impact of mining, including coal mining operations, and particularly on the quality and the availability of water, and of course, the deleterious effect of acid mine drainage. And it's in this context um, that the lack of effective and enforced mining re mine rehabilitation is a major concern for us. And inadequate financial provision for mining rehabilitation and mine closure was identified as a key challenge that contributed to the approximately 6,000 6, abandoned and unrehabilitated mine sites in South Africa. And in addition, and using a place-based approach, we investigated the environmental and economic and social trade-offs of water allocation in the Malacheni water catchment area in Pumalanga. And so from a WWF perspective, how we address these environmental concerns and manage the existing water resources in Mukumalanga will be crucial in how this, the post-economic economy unfolds. As such, it will be critical to any future economic development to determine location, quality, and quantity of water to ensure water is allocated optimally to support collaborative regional sustainable projects, some of which has been highlighted already, that can drive economic development that support a just transition. And I'm not going to belabor this point. I think we are all aware, and Gaylor has also raised it in his introduction, of the impacts of South Africa shifting away from coal, and whether it's voluntary or involuntary, and the impacts that it will have on jobs, livelihoods, and service delivery. And it was in this context that WWF internally started a discussion on the potential of job-rich mine rehabilitation that can support jobs and in so doing socioeconomic development. We uh, internally had a particular interest in the rehabilitation of smaller abandoned mines and wanted to test the stewardship model where all the water users upstream and downstream contribute financially or in kind to the rehabilitation of a specific polluted waterway. But we struggled to find a site that we could use as a pilot and this was largely due to localized political contestation. So a post-mining economy, some pointers. I think we all know there are many studies from elsewhere on how mining affected areas can be redeveloped to support new economic activity. And these range from some of the issues that have, or some of the opportunities raised already from uh, 
uh, repurposing mine assets, investing uh, investments targeting new sectors such as education and tourism, and of course remittances from national government to affected regions. However, I would argue that with a constrained national fiscus, such as the case uh, as in South Africa, it's useful to start with what you have. So some key questions would be, what are the current labor force skills that can be redeployed or reskilled? Are there existing community initiatives that can be supported or upscaled? What is the quality and quantity of available, main, available mine water? Can it be used for agriculture immediately or should it rather be redirected to industrial processes such as tire, tire repurposing for roof tiles or flooring or plastic pyrolysis, for example? Where you have mining companies with deep pockets, is there the possibility of redirecting mine water to address lack of potable water and sanitation in surrounding towns? The Emachachleni example uh, comes to mind. What is the state of available mine owned land? And here the questions are very similar. Is it suitable for agricultural purposes or should it be remediated? In the case of remediation, there are already small bioremediation projects underway with hemp and cotton that not only remove contaminants from the soil, but also delivers a crop that can be further beneficiated. Similarly, regenerative agriculture using cattle, for example, have been shown to be very effective to treat soil impacted by mining activities and deliver nutrients back to the soil and could be potentially very suitable for community-led projects. Of course, existing buildings, electricity, and other infrastructure also provide opportunities, but I assume that the renewable energy input will, will deal quite extensively with that. And then, of course, there's always the opportunities of new and technologies uh, and existing technology application. However, and I cannot stress this strongly enough, the extent to which these discrete opportunities can add up to a meaningful socioeconomic development we hinge on the extent to which there is a regional approach that builds on existing spatial mapping that is already being done, that highlights agricultural potential, susceptibility to climate change, existing economic activity, and the hydrology of different geographies in the, in the region. Um, and an example of, of such an approach is the green engine, and I'm glad Carla is on the call because she could uh, answer questions to this in, uh, later in the Q&A, led by the mine water code and, coordinating body and some mining houses is exactly aimed at demonstrating the viability in the upper Willy Fonts Basin. And it's, it's following an integrated land stewardship model where mine owned land, renewable energy and treated mine water will work together in an integral system to develop various opportunities that will benefit local communities. This also of course raised the question, but what is the role of mining uh, companies? And, and here, um, I've captured some of the questions posed by Mike Solomons from UCT, as well as inputs from participants in a mining dialogue that WWF hosted with Mining Dialogues 360 in 2020. And these questions are essentially, should there be a national process that incorporate post-mining economic planning into the national development planning framework, and thereby integrated with the NDP, Provincial Growth and Development Strategies and the Municipal IDPs? It questions the role of social labor plans to support such economic succession planning. And the consensus was that that is not very likely given that the current focus of social labor plans and mine downscaling does not compel mining companies to consider life beyond mining. A further question was, should future mine rehabilitation planning be more focused or focused explicitly on likely post mining use? And this was regarded as also challenging given the relatively long lifespan of most mines and the possible changes in future post-mining economy, economic opportunities over the period between the commissioning and the closure of mines. Uh, and Carla, I think, will speak more to these challenges as well. And then, of course, there is examples of best practice uh, uh, regarded as such worldwide. Um, and uh, Emachleni Water Reclamation Plant is a case in point. It's a public-private partnership between Anglo Coal and BHP Bulletin, uh, the municipality, and it uses a process of reverse osmosis to uh, provide 25,000 cubic meters of mining, or to convert 25,000 cubic meters of mining effluent into potable drinking water every day. However, there are notes of concern. It's costly, and there are concerns about the long-term sustainability of the project due to the extent to which it's subsidized, and of course, Anglo Coal is also now withdrawing from its, its uh, coal um, activities in South Africa. And then largely just 
a quick point on uh, the role of communities before I hand over to uh, Carla. If we talk about social economic development, a large part of that would entail reaching out um, to those communities whose livelihoods will be affected by these closures. Um, and then it's concerning that community engagement processes are still deeply inadequate. I mean, this despite the recognition from all of us that this is a critical element for any project success and sustainability. And uh, arguably, and I draw here very strongly in the work for, uh, already done by Mining Dialogues 360, we need to make a critical shift to regard communities as partners, not beneficiaries. Uh, effective engagement with uh, communities will engage in investment in those communities to build up participation. And this would be prior to the design of these projects. In other words, communities should be the co-designer of projects that impact their future creating their future. And in so doing, we create resilience and self-sufficiency. And of course, uh, any community engagement requires continuous and consistent engagement to build trust. And lastly, um, and speaking to the need to do skills mapping across the region, it also speaks to uh, the need for skills mapping, identifying aptitudes for various kinds of work, and finding the gaps for those with limited capabilities um, uh, to participate. And of course, uh, gender should always be foremost in mind. And on that, I'm going to hand over to Carla. Uh, well, thank you very much, Louise. Who would have ever thought that the mining industry will present in uh, together with WWF? So it just shows you um, how far we've actually come. So thank you very much for this opportunity to, to present with you. Um, I just want to give a quick introduction of the Mine Water Coordinating Body and the Impact Catalyst. Basically, this situation was realized by the mining industry and national government in 2015, um, but they didn't realize it was going to happen so fast. They actually was planning that this was going to happen in 2030, 2040. So in the past four or five years, we had to speed up um, our collaboration and our planning. And um, because we realized that Currently, the water, mine water management is not sustainable. And the reason why is, is because it's, it's seen um, that mine water management should be done per mine, not as a regional um, drive. And that is actually the problem that we've identified that water unfortunately doesn't stop at a fence. Um, so we have to talk to each other to actually manage this properly. So, um, yeah, five years ago, we had 40 years left. I'm not sure if we still have 40 years left. I know there is some mining companies that um, has said that coal mining will go ahead um, because uh, it's, it's the coal burning, that's the climate change uh, impact and not the coal mining. So there's quite a few uh, projects looking at the repurposing of coal. And as you know, Sassel is very good at that. I mean, they've been doing that for, I think 40 years they took coal and, and made uh, fuel out of that. So, um, and I mean, there's there's so much need for for uh, graphite. Um, so um, maybe we can extend the life um, of of the coal mines, not necessarily the the coal fired power stations. Also, what we've realised is, um, as Louise has mentioned, it is there's significant financial input required. This is a 150 year legacy, and I promise you, 150 years ago, they they didn't even think um, of of the consequences of what they are doing. So, huge financial, huge uh, legal input that's required to regulations that was written up many years ago that didn't consider sustainable development, did not. Uh, incorporate community involvement. So we really need to start rethinking what is a sustainable mine closure, because in the current legislation, unfortunately, is it's fill up your hole, put a bit of grass on it and put a fence on it and, and, and put um, warning signs around it where that is, we, we just can't do that anymore, especially with all the communities that we're dealing with. So that's why it is really strong that private sector, public sector, civil sector communities needs to come together um, and actually start talking um, to each other rather than, than uh, thinking in, in silos. So um, 
what we've been doing for the four, four or five years, we've talking, talked extensively to the national departments and we've got a really good partnership with the provincial government. Um, NASI has, um, yeah, the DDT has been phenomenal in actually coming to the party and talking to the private sector and, and um, making sure that what is in legislation is actually practical po possible because this is, this is the problem always is that we've got really good uh, environmental legislation, but unfortunately it's not always uh, practical or sustainable uh, from the mining sector. Next slide, please, Louise. So as you can see from this very, very busy slide, that was sort of um, the problem that we've identified four or five years ago. And in 2021, we have not <laughs> managed to detangle this really uh, busy slide, but we, we are getting there slowly, but surely I think um, if you recognize what the problem is, you can actually start working towards it. And I think if you remember last year in the presidential SONA, there was a definite focus on um, the water use enforcement, water use, a quicker water use license permitting. And actually uh, DMRE is really trying to align their guidelines and regulation to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we actually know what is a circular green economy and what does it mean to actually get a closure certificate? Because at the moment, everything is hanging. Nobody knows what it is to get a closure certificate. It's, I think it's one of the most difficult things in South Africa to, to obtain a closure certificate because nobody actually really knows what is sustainable mine closure. Um, and then, then the other issue um, that's come in is, is this whole community aspect and how we actually deal with our communities. South African communities are, are extremely complex uh, due to the fact that there's various levels of communities and various cultures in, in our community. So it is, it is, it's quite a science and I think Mining Dialogue 360 is well on its way to actually starting to understand how we deal with a very, very complex uh, situation. So, and then we just realized this problem, you can't deal with this on your own as a, as a single mine or even as a mining group. You actually have to stand together uh, to make sure it's sustainable. Next slide, Louise, please. So as I've mentioned collaboration, like I said today, it's it's a miracle. I uh, When I was at Varsity, I was a huge WWF supporter, but as a geology student, I never imagined that we would actually sit at the same table. So it is so important because all our actions has got an impact um, on, on the environment, on the community and on the economy of South Africa. If you think about, um, it's, it's not actually just a problem in Mapumalanga because if you start closing mines or workers start losing employment in Mapumalanga, their families stay in the Eastern Cape, that community is going to be hugely um, affected. A lot of the products that the mines use in Mapumalanga comes from Gauteng. So lots of businesses and employment opportunities in Gauteng would be influenced. So if you start talking about mining, you actually need to talk about the whole national concept of how this actually has an impact on the whole South African economy. And we need to talk, and I mean, there's similar problems as I know we're talking about Mpumalanga today, but it's quite interesting to see that Limpopo, um, Northern Cape, the West Rand, all of them has got exactly the same problem. And it's not just a mining problem because as soon as we started talking about this, there's a lot of private entities that has to come on board. Just if you talk about tire paralysis, I mean, it's not just a mining industry problem. It is uh, South African breweries, Tiger Brands, Coca-Cola, uh, the list goes on and on and on um, uh, about who needs to get involved in this. So we must rather look at a regional approach where all the players get involved and yes, I know a lot of people feel that, you know, mining made the mess, mining needs to clean it up. Um, but let's uh, talk to each other and see how we can do this, because I think we must stop blaming and stop uh, start working together. Um, I think that's my last slide, Louise, I'm not sure. Oh. So yeah. what does collaboration mean? It's the mining industry needs to start talking to each other. The mining industry and government needs to start talking, the government mining industry and the communities. Then we need the help of technical experts and obviously we will need funding agencies. And, and I promise you in the, in the past four years, I've, I've realized that it's not actually money that's the problem, it's, it's viable projects that is the problem. And we need to stand to come together and actually um, put these projects together that will work for the community 
all three levels um, of government and then all the other industry partners because it's very very important to work together so that we can actually um, realize what is a, a, a just transition and not just a just a, um, uh, energy transition i think is there another one louise no no, no. Is that it yes. <laughs> great well thank you very much thanks for your time thanks Louise and, and and carla for that uh we managed it through the through the technology um Quite a few, quite a few questions as well popping in uh, uh, in, in in the Q and A, um, and I think let me let me try and pick up on on a couple of them uh, for you to to begin with. Um, so first one really uh, is what what do we mean by by a successful rehabilitation project? You know, are they actual you know, project? that we can deem successful uh, when it comes to mine rehabilitation in the country that we can that we can use. Are there some example like this? Um, the, the, second, the second question uh, is about the role of communities. And you know, I think it's it's I think we all can agree, you know, we say, well, you know, communities should should be partners, they should co-design solutions. Um, be curious to hear on how how you you envisage that going forward. Uh, how you do that, you know, um, and you know, how do we use the opportunity to to really restore the situation of communities that have, of course, been been uh, at the at the brunt of the impact for for decades. Um, so, how do communities? Uh, you see communities participating actually actively and driving those development rather than being pure uh, beneficiaries or, or recipients. Um, the, the third question, uh, and I'll, I'll limit it at three for now, uh, is, is around the role of coal mining going forward. What is your understanding of the role of coal mining going forward? Um, you do say that, you know, did mention that, yes, of course, the power stations are the, are the biggest culprit when it comes to, to greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, coal mining in and of itself is, is, is not a particularly sustainable activity uh, and has a vast area of social and environmental impact um, on, on communities, uh, you know, even if we don't talk about climate change. Um, so it would be interesting to understand you know, how you see that, you know, do you see those two being compatible or, or not? Um, because we do see, of course, a trend that it's not just power stations that are going to, to phase down and that did phase down. It's 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 both to the power stations and and the mines. Uh, and of course, even even Cecil uh, in their value chain is looking at alternatives. Um, let me start with that, I guess. Uh, for I'm not sure, I kick um, off. Not sure who wants to take yeah, it. Uh, let me quickly kick off and then you can pick up. I mean, clearly on coal mining, we might have divergent views from a WWF. You will come to put your camera on oh, as well. Oh, apologies, yeah. apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, from a, a coal mining perspective, we might have divergent views. I mean, from a WWF perspective, we don't see any um, long-term future on coal mining. And it's a question of, of how we phase out and how we, how we address the, the impacts of, of the lack of, of employment and the, the spin-off effects uh, in, in local communities. And as for local communities, uh, you know, engaging with communities, I think um, it's clear it's a long process, it's a, it's a hard process, it's identifying um, the leaders in those communities, it's managing uh, uh, inclusive processes, and I think probably the key success thing is to identify activities and capabilities in that community already that that can be built upon um, rather than uh, uh, in, in enforce uh, projects where where, uh, where you actually don't speak to 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 the, the, the pre-existing uh, conditions um, the successful mining rehabilitation project uh, I think it's it, it's probably <laughs> I'm not sure, maybe maybe Carla can answer that better than I do. I think historically mine rehabilitation was very much filling the hole. Um, the le uh, legislation is now uh, 
under amendment to refer to a sustainable end state, which of course open up the opportunities for some of the more innovative approaches that we also discussed today. Um, uh, so maybe I'm going to leave it at that. And, and Carla, you, you the geologist, maybe you, you can pinpoint a successful mine rehabilitation project. Uh, it, it seems to me that there's been lip service paid to that, but it's hardly uh, instances where there's been a regenerative economy around a, a mine. And I think the numbers of abandoned mines that we have is indicative of the, the flawed nature of the process to date. Yeah, so in South Africa, we unfortunately don't have um, a successful project to refer to. There, I think there's only um, that I can think of in the UK is the Vedanta project. Um, and I think there's one in Australia. And then there was one that actually one mine in South Africa that got a closure certificate in the Northern Cape, but um, no project as such as a successful rehab project that actually has got uh, developed an alternative economy um, around that. Carla, are you dodging the bullet about the coal mines and coal mines? <laughs> um, yes, I'm good at dodging bullets. <laughs> um, yeah, like you said, there's there's uh, quite a few different um, discussions going on about this. Um, our minister, the the minister of mineral um, resources. Uh, talks of the next forty years, and then um, when you talk to to other entities, so. Um, yeah, this discussion is, is going on. So the future of coal, yeah, um, it's open for discussion. Well, thanks, thanks, Ruth and, and, and Carla, uh, uh, for now. Um, as I said, there's quite a lot of discussion and quite a lot of questions in the Q&A as well. You're welcome to, to pick up uh, and answer some of those, those questions. Uh, and then we'll get back to them uh, a little uh, a little later. But but for now, thank you, thank you for the the input. Uh, as you say, it's uh, it's also nice to to see multi stakeholder input coming coming forward on that kind of issues. We don't necessarily have to agree on everything to be working together. Uh, so that's really uh, important. We'll uh, move on now to our, to our next uh, our next input, um, which in itself uh, has a lot of touch points as well with, with mine rehabilitation, which will look at the development of agricultural value chains uh, in Impumalanga. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to, to welcome to the floor uh, my colleague, uh, Jillian uh, Chigumira, who is uh, an economist at TIPS uh, and uh, has done a lot of work on development of agricultural value chains uh, in the country and well in the region from agriculture all the way to, to agro-processing. Uh, and we'll share some thumbs sort on that particular opportunity uh, for uh, for the province. Gillian, uh, welcome to uh, put your camera on and the uh, floor is yours. All right. Um, afternoon colleagues, my name is Gillian and I will be talking about a just transition in Pumalanga away from coal. And we will be looking at and trying to unlock jobs in the agricultural sector. So my introduction, I'll be looking at the economic structure of Mpumalanga, areas affected by coal, mining and agriculture and how they're not um, linking together. And then we'll try and look at opportunities that we can have for the miners. And then we'll just have a conclusion. So South African economy is highly energy and carbon intensive and extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. South Africa must achieve a just transition to avoid exacerbating inequality, maintain social cohesion, eradicate poverty, and plan for the physical impacts of climate change. And I think a just transition secures the future and the livelihoods of workers and communities in the transition to a low carbon economy. Now, if we're looking at um, South Africa, it has an estimated 30 billion tons of coal, representing 3.5% of the world's coal resources. And if we look at Mpumalanga, we can see that 83% of coal produced in the country is mined there with the residual in Limpopo, KZN and the Free State. And um, we will see that Mpumalanga holds 24 of the 27 coal mines in South Africa, rendering it the highest carbon intensive province and producer of greenhouse gases. So with the country moving towards a transition away from coal, exploring opportunities for a transition in other sectors becomes essential. 
Now, if we look at the economic structure of Mpumalanga, we can see there that mining contributes the most. So we'll kind of have to have opportunity coming from trade, opportunities coming from manufacturing, the financial sector, government sectors, transport, but today we'll be looking at agriculture there in the green. And so we, what we want to see in future is kind of the green going up and having more jobs in the agricultural sector from the miners. Now we'll look at mining and agriculture in Kumalanga. As um, Gelo had noted before and the other speakers, the three areas that will be affected mainly by coal is Eshlan Zeni, um, Kangala and Khurt Sibande. Now, when we look at um, the graphs that I'm showing here to our left, we will see that in purple, it is the current mining rights. And then in red, there is the prospective applications. And this is just the map of Mpumalanga. And we will see that to our right there, the dark green is very intensive farming land and the light green is intensive farming land as well. And so what we're seeing is um, if we keep on um, approving prospective applications, this will have a very, very negative impact on our intensive farming land that we have in South Africa and particularly in Pumalanga. Now Pumalanga accounts for 46% of South Africa's high potential arable land. And I think that is quite um, very big. And we will see that current and future mining activities will have a significant negative impact on agricultural production as well as long-term implications for food prices and food security. Now about 13.7% of land in Pumalanga is currently being mined and 40% has prospective applications as we saw in the earlier slide that I showed. And so if Pumalanga, if coal mining continues, we could lose about 240,000 hectares of land. And I think this is quite great. And um, BFAP did a study and noted that this would affect the maize crop and the maize prices would go up in future. Now, what can happen um, with the mining rights that's happening at the moment? So to kind of help mining encroaching on agriculture, the preservation of development of agriculture land bill was introduced last year in 2020. So the bill aims to um, preserve and su sustainable development of agricultural land um, it aims to demarcate protected land to ensure high potential land is preserved and protected against non-agricultural use in order to promote long-term agricultural production. And it also discourages land use um, changes from agriculture to non-agricultural uses to prevent the fragmentation of the agro system. So if this bill comes to pass, and we hope it comes to pass, but it's on its way, um, if agricultural land is protected and there are some opportunities to help steer the economy of Mpumalanga away from all gradually. So we're just gonna look at a background um, of what's happening in farming in Mpumalanga. Um, in value of farming, we can see that Mpumalanga is the fourth largest contributor to South Africa and contributes about 38 billion worth of agricultural produce, including livestock as well. And then in terms of um, area farmed by province, we can see there that um, Pumalanga is the fifth largest um, area farmed by province. It counts, as I noted before, for 46% of South Africa's high potential arable land and more than 68% of Mpumalanga is used for agriculture. And I think this is very important um, as I go forward. In terms of the crop produced, we have maize, sugarcane, and soya beans. And uh, we've seen that Mpumalanga drives 44% of South Africa's production of soya beans. And we'll see that maize and soya beans are very huge inputs into the poultry value chain. So it's very important we preserve the land from mining um, and instead use it for agriculture and all the value chains we'll talk about later. And we'll see that Mpumalanga accounts for about 21% of South Africa's citrus production, which is mainly exported in a very big value chain. And Mpumalanga produces 68, 67% sorry, of the country's total banana crop. And then in terms of animals reared, we've, um, the data just excludes poultry, 
but there's a very, very huge poultry industry in Pumalanga, and Pumalanga is the fourth biggest seller of cattle in the country. Now, in terms of employment in agriculture in Pumalanga, um, for full-time and part-time agriculture, the total is about 73,302 employees. And when we look at agricultural wages, this is just the total of the country. Um, wages have gone up from 2,700 rand to about in 2020 now, the recent um, that was published and gazetted was 3,900. But we can see that um, these wages are way, way much lower if we look at mining wages there, which in February 2020 and to May um, lay between 23,000 and 20,000 rand. And so what I'm proposing today is not necessarily having more workers as farmers, but to have more entrepreneurs and having more farmers um, into in Pumalanga. So what can we do to unlock jobs um, in the agricultural sector? Now, first of all, we can unlock jobs through import replacements. If we look at the imports that are coming into South Africa, the top 18, it is poultry, frozen cuts, and edible offals of the Gallus domesticus. It is raw sugar cane in solid form. It is live cattle. It is frozen fowls. It is maize. And again, we have cane or beet sugar coming in there too. Now to unlock some of these import replacements, the system can repurpose land in Pumalanga from mining to agriculture. And this would stimulate opportunities for new entrepreneurs, be it small communal and commercial farmers. This would stimulate opportunities for some new entrepreneurs in agro-processing and manufacturing generate high incomes and ensure food security. So which value chains should we look at that would unlock opportunities um, for new farmers? First of all, we'll look at the sugar value chain. Pumalanga is the second largest producer of sugar cane after KZN. There is opportunity to replace 475,000 tons of sugar, which we're importing if we look at the 2019 data. And so this was, we need about 4,750 hectares that still need to be planted in South Africa. And so these are two opportunities in Pumalanga Lowfeld areas for new entrepreneurs. And then we have the poultry value chain. And we know that poultry is affordable and a stable source for millions of households in South Africa, adds value to maize and soy crops. So there's opportunity to replace 500,000 tons of poultry meat which are being exported if we look at the 2019 data. And this means we need about 1.7 million birds. And so these are also opportunities we can have in Pumalanga for people to go into poultry farming. And then if we're looking at the beef value chain, there's opportunity to replace 287,000 live cattle that we import across um, from SADC. And so again, these are opportunities we're talking about for entrepreneurs. And again, if we're looking at the maize value chain, we have our imports range at 592,000. And this translates to us needing 197,000 hectares that still need to be planted. And so these are opportunities we're talking about um, that could emerge in Pumalanga. Now we also have unlocking jobs from ash to, uh, to aquaculture. We know South Africa produces about 50 million tons of ash per annum. Now fly ash produced during the combustion of powdered coal can be converted to 45% of zeolites. And so what is the zeolites do is they absorb ammonia and heavy metals. And so these are opportunities which can be used for aquaculture, making ammonia filtration systems in fish hatcheries and fish transportation, for example, in tilapia. Now, we also have opportunities in three major value chains, for example, the citrus value chain, macadamia and marula. Now, what we know with these three value chains, it takes quite a long time to grow the trees. And I think that with the time we have now, um, the 40 plus or so years, if we started now with these entrepreneurs growing citrus trees and macadamia and marula, we could really make an effect upon this. And so we would be advoca advocating, sorry, for opportunities to start growing trees now, particularly in macadamia, where South Africa is the second largest producer and most of the macadamia nuts are produced in Pumalanga. 
And another channel that we have um, to create jobs in the value chain is looking at energy of sugar to energy. Now, sugar has been identified by Mpumalanga's Green Economy Plan as a source for biomass. Biomass is energy is also included in the industry's development plan and the DTIC's sugar industry strategy. Now, if we're looking at the milling sectors um, in Mpumalanga, there are about 12 milling um, sugar mills. And what we've seen is all of virtually energy self-sufficient and use the baguettes produced during the processing of cane to generate steam electricity for their use for about 35 to 40 weeks. So what's happening now is the sugar industry has proposed 14 renewable energy projects. And so what we want to see is opportunities for new farmers to grow sugar cane, to feed existing future plants for energy, and even maybe own their own power generating plants. Now, second from last is also creating jobs through with extension offices. As um, Nati had noted before, the Green Economy Plan of Mpumalanga looks at development of the agriculture industry, support for small scale community farming and training in sustainable agricultural practices. There are many thousands of new farmers in South Africa who have access to arable land, but then there's a shortage, a very huge shortage of skills and guidance and capital needed to grow viable farming businesses. So we need for a holistic extinction officers converting farming and management skills, sorry, covering farming and management skills. So in 2021, the department noted that they wanted to increase extinction officers from having one to 850 farmers to having at least one um, extinction officer to 250 farmers. And so the agri department wants to recruit about 10,000 extinction officers and if we look at the pay scale of um, the extension offices, it's about 21,300 Rand. And this is sort of similar to mining salaries. So this is also another avenue that we could be looking at in the transition to agriculture and some jobs within the agricultural sector from mining. Now, in conclusion, transitioning to agriculture is one avenue in the just transition away from coal. Already there are programs to help upcoming entrepreneurs in Pumalanga, for example, the Emma Simini and the Esbayeni, which supports um, subsistence farming to small scale farmers and commercial farmers. There's the Pumalanga 40 Young Farmer Incubator Program, which plans to commercialize 20 farms. We also have Agri Parks in Progress, for example, one that will be coming through the Bush Buckridge Agri Industrial Park. So to roll out services to help farmers to get better access to market, storage facilities and equipment and hire. And we've also seen that Mpumalang has four farmer production support units that will link smallholder with market storage, some processing in the local market um, and including mechanization. So in the end, what we're trying to say here is um, this is not, we know that agriculture is not the only solution in the just transition, but there are opportunities we could start taking off advantage now, and um, this would have a very great impact in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Julian, for this very comprehensive overview of the opportunities uh, that could be presenting. Um, quite a few questions as well in the, in the Q&A, but I'll pick up, pick up on a couple of them. Um, the first one, I think it's something you mentioned, but I think it's an important one, is that you know, of course, the, the wages or the salaries coming out of agriculture are much lower than in the mining industry overall. Um, so how do, we, how do we see that playing out you know, going forward uh, for, for, for the region, but also for, for communities? Um, and, and I guess the, the, the other question is, is um, what's the viability of, of all those opportunities considering the degradation of the land? Uh, in mining areas already, I mean that speaks to the competition that you've highlighted between mining and you know and agricultural uh, applications. But but certainly when it comes to mining rehabilitation, you've got land that that's been that's been heavily degraded. Um, that's the case of coal, but of course other mining activities. So what's the opportunity to to then utilize that land uh, for agricultural purposes? Um, yeah, let's start with that. Thanks. All right. 
Um, so as I'd mentioned earlier, in terms of wages, these are definitely lower uh, compared to that of mining. And so for this presentation, what I'm actually advocating for is to um, create entrepreneurs who are actually farmers and not farm workers. And I think um, it's a viable system um, looking at all the master plans that we have, for example, the poultry master plan, which looks into making new um, farmers who farm poultry in Pumalang and across the region in South Africa. And so I think that um, it is not a solution to say that we'll have so, so many X and X entrepreneurs, but I think it's a start that we could start looking at. And then with the other question of the viability of the land, I think I will tackle it in two ways. I think the first one is um, when I showed the graph where we have the potential mining rights, those are overriding the very intensive agricultural land. And so with the new bill that's coming, we could actually save the intensive agricultural land and we could go on with these projects that I'm talking about. And then secondly, I'm trying to use the extra mining land that is probably not, we you can't rehabilitate it to that extent. We could use it for growing sugar cane um, for the biomass industry and not necessarily for food that can be consumed and can be contaminated um, in that regard. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Dorian. I think that's that was that was very useful. There's a lot of questions in the Q and A, which uh, I think you can you can turn turn to as well uh, on on some of the plans, uh, and then hopefully we have time to to go back to some of the questions live as well. Thanks so much, uh, Jillian. Um, we're now turning to uh, a, a quite a different opportunity, but the one that's uh, generally on, on everybody's lips uh, when we're talking about just transition and, and, and Empu Malanga, which is the potential to develop renewable energy, uh, be it for electricity production or for manufacturing. Uh, this seems to be uh, generally the first thing that, that everybody uh, mentions. We're very pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Stanley uh, Similani from the, the CSR. Uh, Stanley, the senior researcher in climate services at the, at the CSR, uh, has done a significant amount of work on, on just transition uh, and particularly on uh, the role of renewable energy in, uh, in the just transition of South Africa going forward. Um, Stanley, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm, I hope I'm audible. I just put my headset. I have a six months old son that uh, sometimes ignores. So I hope, am I audible enough? Perfectly fine, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Afternoon colleagues, uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Stanley Similane. I'm from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. So I'm not gonna touch on the slide, it just says who is CSIR. I can just say established in terms of the Scientific Research Council Act. That's all. So this is the content that I'm going to share with you. Drivers for the energy transition. Uh, why is this important? Probably localization, specifically focusing on the energy when I speak about localization. Then I'll show you a case study around uh, some manufacturing and key enablers for energy transition in South Africa. So yeah, mainly uh, these are the main um, drivers of course, uh, CO2, and we need to understand that, you know, the coal sector uh, has existed for many, many years, almost like 300 years. So uh, the shift is uh, one uh, thing important to mention, the shift is not due to anything else in South Africa, but uh, we are phasing out coal power stations that would... Uh, that are, have aged. So I'll show you the average age of our coal power stations. But mainly then there's a Paris Agreement, of course, we have a resource with regards to renewable energy, and we have also have energy poverty, which is something that uh, renewables particularly can play a role. So this is basically chapter five of, of the NDP, the National Development Plan. So I tried to summarize what, what it's talk about. So it, which is mainly environmental sustainability, reducing pollution, social equity, and reliable and efficient energy services that are, of course, competitive and creating jobs. So, so these are the main drivers for the transition. So just this is the context of uh, what is going on in Pumalanga. So you see here, we see the contribution 
towards the GDP, you see it's the, it is the third largest contributor, that is the coal sector. Uh, so they contributed about 22 billion uh, in 2020. Uh, you have 93,000 direct jobs, 170 indirect. Uh, you're sitting at about 129 billion in sales. That was 2017 in a country that sits with around the 1% unemployment rate, uh, which only factors what uh, state SA only covers. So that's why this is really critically important because as you are going to phase out coal power stations, uh, you'd realize this is the key driver. So that's just the average. So these are power stations in South Africa. Uh, you see they've existed for many, many years, some over 50 years. And on average, you're sitting at about 42.4, if you like, uh, years, uh, age, if you like, of, of our power stations, which is the reason why they're phasing out. So on this slide, this comes directly from the Integrated Resource Plan, plan the IRP 2019. So when you look at that plan, you see that we are going to lose about 5,732 megawatts of uh, coal. Uh, and if that plan is going to be followed as it is, that would be around the end of 2023. Yes, because uh, there's many challenges from the supply side, particularly in South Africa, for, for, for the energy supply. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're going to shut down, but yeah, even if they don't shut down because of their age, you are likely to have uh, teething problems, if you like. So uh, things breaking down, resulting in, in, in faults every now and then because of the age. So what the, the, the integrated resource plan shows us is that uh, uh, this will be replaced by around 1,500 megawatts, which I'll show you later on. But uh, overall, you're losing about 11,017 uh, megawatts of coal that will shut down because of the, the age. So that is exactly from the integrated resource plan. So this is the global outlook. So uh, even the current existing mines in South Africa not all the coal is utilized domestically. So we export some of the coals, so some of the coal resources we have, and the shift that you'd see uh, globally, uh, a country like India, for example, uh, has indicated that uh, they will not be importing more coal. And there's a shift as well in those countries, particularly if you think about India, you think about China, you'd see also they've, uh, they, they've adopted renewable energy technologies. So China, it's wind and PV sits around uh, uh, three and 5% in India, it's about 10% or so. But the size or the energy system size of those countries, it's almost uh, not even double, uh, almost, uh, yeah, over uh, a million megawatts, uh, uh, if you like, uh, relative to South Africa. If I recall correctly, for example, in India, uh, their solar contribution is 10%, but it's equivalent, it's close to 40,000 megawatts, which is what South Africa produces for the entire country. So those are the differences. But mainly what is important is, this slide, is that we start to see a decline. So South Africa coal exports have already declined in 2018. And this is the trend because of the Paris Agreement that you are going to see moving forward. Uh, we, these are the countries, uh, if you look at the map on the central that we, we used to export to, and all of them have commitments around sustainability. And in 2009, just to take you further, uh, South Africa used to be one of the uh, top three coal exporters. 10 years later or 11 years later, we are, uh, uh, I think, number seven relative to these countries that you could uh, uh, compare here between China, Australia, and India in terms of coal exports, uh, sending coal to other countries. So that's the shift. And if you're going to, you, you must think about this in the context of, if then you close some of the coal power stations, some of the coal will be available. And uh, yeah, I don't know where, what's going to happen to that coal. Yeah, on this slide, I'm showing you the renewable energy development zones. You'd see that most of uh, 
these zones are outside Mpumalanga. Zone nine only, the one that I circled in red, is the one that is proposed uh, in Mpumalanga. Uh, however, uh, Mpumalanga has its own strengths, particularly for electricity generation. One, you have uh, possible as assets that might be stranded. We know everybody's talking of repurposing some of the uh, coal assets that would be there. And there's a couple of things that you, you can do to, uh, to, 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 to try to repurpose. But you have the grid infrastructure, so transmission lines would be there. So for example, to move uh, power generated in Northern Cape towards Gauteng, if for, for example, you'll have uh, power losses, for example, that, 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 and that you would not have if you had to generate power in the Mpumalanga area. So those are some of the strengths. Uh, and the resource, of course, itself, it's not the same relative to Northern Cape and, and Western Cape, if you like. But we know uh, most of our solar, the strongest area is within Northern Cape. But uh, if you measure the resource between Northern Cape and Pumalanga, the difference is about 10%. So it's not that bad. So, but that simply means that there has, there has to be a premium that has to be paid if uh, 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 South Africa uh, wants to utilize renewable energy uh, technologies to contribute to a just energy transition. Because of course, because we have the greatest resources in the coastal line, as well as the Northern Cape, that simply means uh, the kilowatt hour electricity uh, uh, that you generate in Pumalanga, of course, would be higher than what you generate in Northern Cape. So if uh, project developers are competing, they are likely to go for areas where they'll produce the cheapest electricity. Whereas if you were to have a ring fenced call uh, from Pumalanga, for example, then that would ensure that everyone competes or on the same uh, 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 conditions, if you like. That's that. Yeah, so this slide further just displays where the projects are. So the blue is the coal that exists and a couple of uh, 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 s rather on, on the left. And uh, you'd see uh, the ones in Cape Town, your palm storage, et cetera, in the central area. The, the yellowish part on the right, that's where most of our renewable energy projects are currently deployed. And you'd see they are almost non-existent around the Mpumalanga province. So yeah, this uh, I just took from the uh, minister's address last week. Uh, so, but it, it, it emanates from the integrated resource plan. So what we see from that announcement, there was that 2000 a, a risk mitigation that was awarded uh, last week. But on that speech, you'd see the 1,600 megawatt, the bluish one, which is wind. Uh, the call is, uh, I think, coming uh, around August, if they said, or September. I can't recall the details. Even the 513 uh, uh, battery storage is also going to come. So we're going to have about 2,600 megawatts. That will be round five that is coming this year. So the, the 1,000 will be ring fence for solar PV and 1,006. Then we're going to have round six, which uh, would include uh, this battery storage I spoke about. Probably we are likely to see a this code 750. So you think about that 5,782 megawatts that was likely to be replaced uh, by 750. And if you combine the two, which is a uh, position for or, 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 or targeted for 2027, that would be about 26%. And there's nothing else, particularly for coal, until 2030. There are other technologies. For example, wind proceeds at a consistent 1,600 megawatt in terms of the integrated resource plan annually, which gives you a total of about 14,400 megawatts. Uh, there are silent peers uh, for, for solar PV, but you get a total of, of about 6,800 megawatts. Of, then you have gas as well, which is the 3,000 uh, megawatts that, that, that is in rail, and you have the embedded generation as well. So that, that is the status quo and um, in terms of what's going to transpire. So yeah, these are just the net jobs uh, that you quantified from the integrated resource plan. So we aggregate everything else 
terms of uh, what you're going to lose. So on, on the slides that I showed you where we are uh, phasing out coal power stations, then we, we, multi, we quantify how many jobs would be lost there. Uh, you know, those jobs are mainly o o &M jobs, so operations and maintenance, because construction jobs existed when those power stations were constructed and they don't exist anymore. But of course, there are other service providers that will be affected that currently, you know, uh, uh, feed into this ONM and any components of maintenance that might be required for, 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 for these coal power stations. But in a nutshell, so yeah, you'd see that uh, uh, the bluish one is, is, is wind. So you get about 15.3% uh, 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 increase from the period of, uh, 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 if you look from, 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 from uh, 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 this area 2018, until 2030. So those are the numbers on the integrated resource plan. So there is that net increase. The dilemma or the challenge or, or, or what would the critics of renewable energy say is that uh, renewable energy jobs are not like uh, coal jobs, whereby you will have a coal mine that will exist for 30 years and feeding coal. Whereas these jobs, uh, particularly construction jobs, because most of the jobs for renewables are in construction, in the construction phase, and that does not last forever. It may, at most, it would last for 24 months. And in in in, in times where you have uh, uh, power supply challenges, uh, they they might be even shorter than that because more people might be deployed to try uh, finish the construction much quicker and provide the power that that is is required. So yeah, that's that's just that. Uh, so yeah, some proposed solution from the localization point of view. One, uh, particularly for renewable energy components, critically important to note is uh, most of these technologies, uh, there's already IP on them, they've been developed elsewhere. So we can probably localize them and uh, you know import prototypes that are developed elsewhere and they start to, to manufacture them rather than starting the entire R&D process uh, from scratch. So yeah, for example, industrialization, industrialization, industrialization tends to be a step-by-step -step process, but some countries get stuck in the middle. And I'll show you a case study in terms of uh, what we've, we've done. So for example, these are some of the things or opportunities that we could localize at. Uh, uh, we are moving into a space from the policy point of view, where as long as you are not selling electricity, you'd be allowed to generate your own power. Uh, there were some uh, licensing requirements and challenges in that regard, but it looks like from, from, from what the minister said last week, uh, there's going to be uh, that room. Of course, in the context of uh, the integrated resource plan. So nothing would, it doesn't mean that uh, you would procure forever. Once the limit that is in the IRP is reached, then that will have to be managed. But there are opportunities for batteries, for example. It's a great opportunity because we know the sun does not shine 24 seven, nor the wind blows at 24 seven hours. And uh, particularly in South Africa, uh, you have manganese that you can also use uh, to generate cattle's material of uh, nickel mining. If you think of this in the sub-Sahara region context, uh, Mozambique uh, has uh, 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 graphite, uh, DRC, uh, coal bed. So these are the resources. And if you start to think of, of this from a regional uh, 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 market creation, especially because the South African energy size uh, is not big as that of China, India, et cetera. So these are some of the opportunities whereby we can start to develop this type of technologies. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, the, uh, we know, for example, the electric vehicle sits on the green transport strategy, but that's where we are heading. And we need to, you know, you wanna need batteries, you wanna uh, need all the infrastructure to charge your electric vehicles. But this, this is an opportunity that we, we, we can play in. For example, uh, in the wind space, I think uh, 
probably from the generator development and towers and plates. That's the, the space we could uh, play in. Uh, but these are similar opportunities. So these are just straight out the value chains of the technologies that are currently being adopted. One of the key things to think about is that uh, there is uh, what we call the, the enterprise development aspect of all the renewable energy projects uh, that would be developed. So all those projects that I showed you uh, that will replace the coal power stations, they left to comply with that 30% uh, assigned uh, for economic development. So if you think about it in a 90-10 or, uh, or, or 80-20 type of projects, it, for, for renewable energy projects, you have about 70-30 ratio. And that 70%, the 30% is assigned for economic development, which includes uh, ownership, black management, socioeconomic development, uh, control management, uh, uh, enterprise development, all that 30% that, that is assigned to those components. So these are the opportunities in the transition as we adopt these, these, these technologies. Yeah, for this one, uh, I've already uh, uh, ass assessed uh, economic feasibility and which I think maybe what I did not mention, even in the two previous examples, the battery and PV, the same exercise has to be done. So for example, I've assessed here, we published this paper last year, end of the year, but you see what we are trying to do, we are trying to use a methodology called the MSP, minimum sustainable price. Uh, basically what we do, you run your uh, discounted cash flows and your entire financial analysis, except, for, uh, but you don't have the income. So you look for the least number uh, that could be income to, to try and make you break even. And in this regard, uh, the number that uh, allowed us to break even was about uh, 14 US dollars per watt of PV that, that we could produce. Of course, the internal rate of return of that is, is not attractive. It's about 1.75%. Uh, uh, That's not when you run the sensitivity analysis, you got to a maximum of uh, 3.51. Uh, percent in terms of when we push that to 15 percent. But yeah, those, these are the challenges. And uh, the, the next uh, price point, that's what the Chinese are selling at. So you could push it as far as uh, probably uh, uh, 21 uh, uh, US dollar cents per, per, per watt. But still, that's not profitable. And there are a number of factors that makes this not profitable. So you see this particular example, I, I was looking at uh, 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 polycrystalline type of a uh, solar PV specifically. So, but these are some of the factors that is different. So you see that it's China against uh, South Africa in terms of the labor costs. So you see South Africa is shooting up, has been shooting up and China is, is, is uh, goes the, the other way. So those are some of the challenges, particularly all, all, if you think about all the OPEX numbers. So when uh, we did those analysis, uh, th those are some of the challenges that we have beyond the IP and the RRT. So yeah, this, uh, uh, the, this is the minimum sustainable price for solar PV. Looks like it's going to continue to decline uh, even uh, much further, but it's been declining. So, so we are sitting at about 0 0.14 for the South African case, but it might even reach uh, 10 uh, US uh, dollars per, uh, cents per, 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 per watt uh, moving forward. So yeah, that's the, that is the status. For, so that, that was just an example. So this is probably my, my last slide. I think what is important for the just energy transition in South Africa, we need a, to have a planning framework in terms of how is this going to unfold. And there are many components uh, that would contribute. And my humble view is that uh, energy is not the only solution. So I'm glad colleagues from agriculture uh, and many other sectors, manufacturing can also contribute to the just transition. So I think the, the, the platform or, or an engagement platform between labor movement uh, and, and, and government and all the stakeholders is critically important because remember they have members that currently work in the coal sector and uh, 
they 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 they, they are likely to be losers. And I must be honest, I don't think everyone else is going to be a winner. And uh, uh, sometime last year, we worked on a reskilling framework for a just energy transition in South Africa, particularly looking at whether workers can, or what type of skills are required in these technologies that the country will be adopting. And I don't think even some of the people that work in the coal sector have the skills that might be required in, for example, a solar and wind and gas and all these technologies that we are adopting. So yeah, there has to be some so a, so a social protection plan. Uh, we need to invest in infrastructure, of course. Uh, we need to reskill those that could be reskilled. And some of the opportunities could not necessarily be located within Pumalang. They could be trade-offs that sit within different provinces, and that has to be taken into account as well. Yeah, uh, economic diversification pathway, I think, this is the measure framework that is required to try integrate everything else and, and the stuff that may probably did not touch on today, but to say what role uh, in a context of a CGE thinking, if you like, uh, uh, whereby what role could, could all these different sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, and so on, renewables, when you integrate them into a framework, what role could they, they really play? Of course, then you can try to optimize on localization opportunities, on, of course, on, comp on, 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 on components where we, we are comp competitive. And then, uh, yeah, we could, could try to understand trade-offs outside the, where the, the, the region, even outside the country to say, if you were to establish uh, a plant of some, sort that would manufacture and how is the export market looking uh, like for, for, for any products that we might be produced from all these sectors that can play a role to contribute to a just transition framework. So yeah, then we can think about sub saharan region as a great opportunity, particularly if you think about the solar resource, you see it with about 5.6 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter in the entire SADC region. And if you think about electrification challenges in Sub-Sahara, there's a great opportunity in there. Of course, evidence-based decision supporting tools are critically important to make sure that at least any decisions uh, that we take in a transition are, are informed and we, we, then we can have the anticipated results. So yeah, thank you so much. These are, this is just my last slide. I don't have to go through it, but yeah, this just shows the positives that could be really achieved uh, if we adopt a just uh, transition in, in South Africa from all the technologies that uh, we can adopt and essentially contribute to uh, universal access to energy for everyone else. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sunny, for this uh, very extensive uh, presentation on the uh, on the deployment of the renewable energy value chain uh, in uh, in the country, uh, and particularly as it pertains to just transition, um, you covered you covered really a, a lot of ground uh, in in the presentation, um, which is great. Uh, I, we are fast uh, fast running out of time for for today. Um, so I do want to uh, to, to segue uh, for now into uh, to our next input, and hope you can uh, bear with us for a few extra minutes uh, today. Uh, and hand over to to our last uh, our last panelist, um, Belinda, uh, who is the, the president of the South African Coal Ash Association. Uh, she's also the general manager of uh, Quick Bulk, which is a company of uh, Quick Build General Purpose Cement. To discuss some of the emerging opportunities uh, associated with the potential use of coal ash that's being generated uh, by the uh, burning of coal in our uh, power stations in the country. Um, so Belinda, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gaylon. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, as Gaylor has mentioned, I am the president of the Coal Ash Association. And we have been recently tasked 
by ESCOM ERI, which is the management of Fly Ash in ESCOM, to look at certain um, ways of handling the dumps that we have, as well as the, the ash, what they call fresh ash that is produced. And they've actually broken it down into five working groups. And the one is accessibility and reliability of supply. Um, the other one is the business incubation work group, um, SME uh, working group, uh, research and development, as well as a certain um, uh, economics of the different grades of ash that is commercially required. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a lot of preliminary work we are doing um, and we will obviously present to ESCOM and to ERI um, and that is why unfortunately I couldn't share today with you the exact detail. Um, power stations, if we look at the two new power stations currently being built, those power stations have got a life of 50 years. So we're still going to continue to, to have coal ash produce, uh, produced from the coal power stations. Um, yes, there is a lot of drive for, for solar power and for, for green energy to be produced. But I think for the next 20 years at least, um, we are going to be sitting with our main source of electric, electricity generation coming from coal-fired power stations. And I've invited along Dr. Kelly Reynolds. She's a chief consultant at ESCOM, and she's also the vice president of the Coal S Association. And Kelly's done a lot of work with the management of water as well as ash. Um, so if, with your permission, if we can hand over to Kelly just for five minutes. Um, thanks, Belinda. Um, just to, uh, she's, she's given me like the whole power station to explain. Uh, so um, about 2015, we were approached actually by a Nampumalanga group to start looking at making our ash more available and utilizing it more job creation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have been looking into ash beneficiation utilization since about, since the early 90s. And we've never actually had a, a forum to take it out. So now it's grown exponentially. Um, We've managed to get some of the legislation changed so that ash is no longer classified as a waste if we beneficiate it. So having said all of that, yes, Eskom produces in the region of 35 to 40, 000, 40 million tons a year, depending on how you look at it and how you actually um, uh, ex ex expand on ash. And I see that you'd like me to be visible. I can't do that. I'll crash my system, unfortunately. I'll try and make a plan the next time. But having said all of that, Eskom produces all this ash, but because Eskom's um, water treatment philosophy is zero liquid effluent discharge, we also use our ash as a salt sink for our effluents. So our water cascades from uh, a good quality to a low quality, and that lower quality water is used as a, a carrying medium for our ash to the ash dams or to control dust um, in forms of dust suppression on our dry dumps. So we don't actually have those 35 to 40 million tons of ash available. At the moment, we sell about 7% of it through some off takers on some of our plants. And we're looking that we should be able to sell about 17 to 20% of the ash we produce. The rest is still required for water treatment. So it's a little bit of a tricky balancing act we've got to do. And going forward, what Eskom has decided to do is actively research the use of ash in beneficiation techniques. And the big five is where we started, as we call them. So it's cement, bricks, road construction, agriculture, and mine backfilling. Of course, all of those will use massive volumes of our ash and We'll be look, pushing those quite strongly. We have um, engaged with um, the Department of Environmental Affairs when it was now DEF, and we're involved with them on many of the projects and are taking them forward under there and the Department of Water Affairs auspices. So since then, as Belinda mentioned, um, ERI, which is the Road Tech um, Commercialization Wing for Eskom, has opened up a forum which 
is looking at different aspects of ash beneficiation. So I had the research and testing one where Belinda heads the um, accessibility and transportability, I think Belinda. Um, but certainly we are looking into making it a more easily um, obtainable product. We have got a number of off takers that have been given contracts between 10 and 20 years to take the ash off our plants. Many of those um, off takers are not yet funded. They needed to have the contract before they could get funding for the off take equipment. It's not as simple as it sounds. Um, they can't have the ash wet. So when we start dampening the ash or conditioning it to take it out to our handling facilities, then that ash is no longer viable to be used in many of the products. So it's a balancing act. They do have to have um, extensive plant within the power station, which has its own environment, um, environmental and engineering um, constraints. So certainly those have got to be other considerations. And we're working with those off takers through the Coal Ash Association and um, enterprises to actually get these products up and going. But my mandate at the moment with Belinda is to try and get as many different techniques out there that we can use the ash for in terms of beneficiation just to limit what we're putting out on our dams to limit the environmental impact we're having but I'm happy to hear we're talking zeolites we're talking mine backfilling we're talking acid mine drainage treatment so we're certainly on the right track I just hope that ash can play a, a big role in taking this this provincial initiative forward and that we get going in that direction. So I think that's mainly where I am. Is that what you wanted, Belinda? Thanks, Kelly. That's perfect. Thank you, Gaylo. Thanks, uh, Belinda and, and, and Kelly for this for this short input. Uh, maybe just uh, just one question. Do you have an idea of of uh, I think you've got a good idea of all the opportunities that are available, but uh, are there a number of what would be the most promising ones, I guess, in the short term? Um, do you have an idea of, of that uh, um, going forward? Currently, in the short term, some application of fly ash is the most utilized um, medium of, of this, this product called fly ash or coal ash that is but the working groups that we are putting together, I mean, it's 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 endless. There's agriculture. There's um, it's absolutely you you know um, houses being built. We we talk about um, zero cement concrete being produced. It's being produced. Uh, there's some big projects where they've uh, quite recently one of the wind farms where there was zero cement put into the foundations and the concrete. So, and Kelly is very involved with this. Um, there's also an initiative with one of our members who can produce a, a stove, which generates um, heat, it generates warmth, and it, you know, it decreases, the, I think the emissions of the, that, that are burnt are, it's, 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 not even, it's not even measured because it's so low. So there's a lot of initiatives out there which we are working on, which we'll present to the ESCOM um, working group. And you know, once we've got this fully conclusive report, we'd like to share it with everybody because these, you know, a lot of the panelists have have spoken about the, the need to create jobs, the need to give back to the communities. Um, it's it's for, and, and ESCOM is very very aware of this. Gaylor, maybe to also answer you, um, going forward, the ones we've seen the most progress on are, as Belinda said, the zero cement concretes. Um, we have four roads that are under construction using either ash itself in its different fractions or the, the cement, um, sorry, the concrete type or concrete ashes. And then mine backfilling. We've got a couple of cases that are going on on that at the moment. There's actually three. Um, so those are certainly big, big applications. We're seeing a lot of interactions, a lot of interest from the mines um, in terms of re re rehabilitating their soils and ameliorating their soils. So 
I think those are the big ones at the moment. The, the smaller ones um, where it's used as a filler, rubber, paint, whatever you can name it, um, those ones are going a bit more slowly. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a teaching exercise. We've got to let people know what we can and can't do with the ash. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kelly and Belinda. Um, this uh, draws uh, the session for today to, to a close. I uh, want to really take a, a second to thank everyone for attending, uh, especially uh, those that managed to stay a little bit over time. Apologies for, uh, for that. Really thank our, uh, our panelists uh, and our speakers today. Uh, we had a fantastic lineup. And I can see from the from the engagement in the chat, but also in the Q and A, that uh, clearly we, we should have booked more time. Um, but uh, don't worry, this is not the last of our uh, webinars on the topic, and we're going to keep uh, exploring those issues going forward as part of our series of, of webinars on on the just transition. We certainly look forward to to welcoming you at our future events um, on the just transition, as well as on other topics. Uh, look out for um, the recording as well as the presentations that will be shared uh, as well as the invites for our future events. Uh, thank you very much and have a good day further. Bye-bye.